All right, thank you. And thanks to the rest of the uh, group here that's uh, sticking it out. Uh, I think this is really interesting and, and both novel uh, topic uh, that spans not only the procedures, technique, technology, but um, also access. Um, so in terms of uh, disclosures, I do get salary support from Blue Cross and Blue Shield for my participation in the Michigan Bariatric Surgery Collaborative, which I'll reference a little bit later. But uh, a couple of other disclosures. Uh, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm married to one. This is my wife. And so uh, I actually get to hang out a lot with uh, orthopedic surgeons. And uh, it's quite eye-opening to hear other clinicians uh, to, to find out what they know or don't know and, uh, about bariatric surgery. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, in addition, I myself have not uh, performed a bariatric surg uh, surgery procedure for the sole purpose of bridging somebody to um, to a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, but I do a lot of bariatric procedures and I certainly do a lot of uh, cases with end-stage renal disease. But I'm working with Dr. Waits at the University of Michigan uh, to develop a program where we can do just that for um, their patient population. And I did want to highlight one of our residents, Dr. Montgomery, who had uh, two posters on the topic too. So I'm going to cover pros and cons, uh, timing of the operation, as well as try to leave you with some treatment strategies. I'm going to try to do it all in 13 minutes and 41 seconds. And um, in order to do that for two procedures, uh, I'm really going to just like focus on the highlights of what I found in my literature review. So orthopedic surgery is mostly hip and knee sur uh, procedures when we talk about orthopedic uh, procedures uh, before and after bariatric surgery. So as you know, uh, obesity affects osteoarthritis. Uh, certainly does so in multiple mechanisms, not only bi uh, biomechanical, but also inflammatory changes at the joints. This is an interesting fact. Think about this. For every one pound uh, uh, that a patient weighs, uh, their hip sees two to three times the, that amount of force, and their knee sees about five to six um, times that amount of, of force. So this is incredible. Somebody even comes in who's 200 pounds. They're um, actually 400 pounds at the hip and nearly 1,000 pounds at the knee. So uh, very important for patients uh, to lose weight before any kind of knee arthroplasty or hip arthroplasty because certainly complication rates go up when um, the BMI goes up. And the complications are abound both from infection, wound healing, high risk of VTE, and need for revisional uh, procedures. So what can bariatric surgery do? So this is a nice review, uh, nine studies over 38,000 patients who've had orthopedic surgery. Uh, and they looked at uh, and compared um, uh, patients had bariatric uh, procedures um, uh, beforehand. And um, so there's certainly improvements in short-term medical uh, complications, length of stay, in particular operative time, which uh, you, uh, you would think uh, is obvious uh, when people lose weight, the operative time would go down. And uh, there's a slightly lower rate of perioperative um, or periprosthetic infection, but only in the knee, not necessarily in the hip. And you can see there's no change in superficial wound infection, thromboembolism, and other long-term risks. Um, in terms of timing, this is a little hard to, to sort out because just like in the previous um, presentation, there's a lot of heterogeneity to the actual uh, data. So this is, I like this uh, mostly because of the title too, Ruin Why, it's very clever. Um, 12 studies, uh, and again, you know, they looked at anywhere between six months before uh, uh, orthopedic procedure to 65 months afterwards. There's a fair range in BMI uh, when they're uh, comparing the different groups. And also the comparison groups themselves were, were all over the place looking at bo both before and after bariatric surgery and then matched cohorts and then non-obese patients. Uh, and what I found also a little surprising was uh, a lot of times they lumped both operations, the knee and the hip uh, arthroplasty in the same group when they were comparing it, and they're obviously different operations. And more so that was uh, problematic as they lumped all the bariatric procedures together too, a lot of times both lap and open. So when you're looking at outcomes of that, it was a little hard to decipher um, you, you know, what's the best outcome for these patients, especially when they're uh, putting you know, lap band and duodenal switch in the same group. Uh, nonetheless, the, the end point of this um, review is basically stating that referral uh, for selected patients is reasonable. They actually had uh, made an interesting point of that bariatric surgery can relieve joint pain to the point where arthroplasty is no longer necessary, but there still needs better data in order to uh, demonstrate that. And that data is actually forthcoming. There's a, a study out there now with the completion date of 2020 where they're looking specifically at sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass prior to knee, uh, knee replacement, and they have um, a set of metrics that, that they're following. So that'll be completed, and we'll have nice prospective data on that. 
Um, now, the flip side of bariatric surgery is that it can also cause problems. And I've heard this from um, orthopedic surgeons when they go in and they actually do the knee replacement. They say it's like um, it's like hammering on chalk; it like falls apart. So I was like, okay, that's that's interesting. Now, certainly, nutritional deficiencies can lead to impaired wound healing, but uh, also there's a, a, a real risk of osteopenia in the, this patient population after bariatric surgery. Not only decreased bone stress, but uh, decreased bone mineral uh, density from um, deficiency, you know, vitamin D and calcium deficiencies, and that can lead to more fractures. And uh, a decrease in muscle mass, too, can lead to uh, prosthetic hip instability. And one thing we should always point out, too, if somebody's getting a Renoir gastric bypass, they can't take NSAIDs anymore, which is um, uh, very important for patients with orthopedic problems. So it helps in terms of knowledge ahead of time uh, with um, uh, patient selection. Uh, of course, vitamin uh, deficiencies are a real deal. Uh, this is uh, from the ASMBS that reported uh, as high as 90% in just the obese patient population, of course, uh, even up to 100% in the post-bariatric patients. And they have uh, specific screening, prevention, and treatment uh, protocols within the ASMBS uh, that should be followed, and that should be very important for any patient, particularly if they're, uh, of course, going on to orthopedic procedures. Okay, organ transplant. Um, this is uh, narrowed down between uh, kidney and liver, so I'll start with uh, kidney. So just like osteoarthritis, uh, obesity affects um, kidney function. It uh, increases the risk of end-stage renal disease, uh, kidney stones, as well as kidney uh, renal cell cancer, and there's certainly a lot of obesity-mediated uh, physiology with that. Important fact here, remember, one-fifth of patients with end-stage renal disease have a BMI of over uh, 35. That's, that's a big chunk of the population that... Uh, that transplant surgeons have to um, look at and consider. And what's also encouraging is that a lot of these risks are actually reversible when um, obesity improves. Uh, and with bariatric surgery, there's been shown improvement in GFR and decreased risk of uh, decline in GFR and um, creatinine over time. And uh, there is a slightly uh, better improvement after gastric bypass than with sleeve gastrectomy. Um, now, one important thing to point out with bariatric surgery in this patient population, though, is that you can also um, send people the other way. If somebody is dehydrated or has considerable intraoperative hypotension, their, um, their kidney function could end up in uh, serious uh, end-stage renal disease to the point of dialysis, and that risk is real. And so uh, also a very tricky patient population to consider uh, if they're not at the point of uh, ready for transplantation. Uh, kidney stones also increases after bariatric surgery, and uh, some of the risk factors uh, listed there, fat malabsorption seems to be a driver of this, so higher rates in, after um, Renoir gastric bypass uh, as opposed to gastric banding or sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, this is one of the posters that was actually presented um, or shown here at SAGES this past, uh, or this year. Uh, this is looking at risk of uh, bariatric surgery among patients with end-stage renal disease, and the thing that uh, they're pointing out they're using the MBSA QIP data registry, just looking at patients with end-stage renal disease. And really, when you compare the patient populations who have had bariatric surgery with end-stage renal disease, they do have a higher risk of complications afterwards, but the absolute risk uh, is no greater than 2% the, the, of the general population. So it's not as high as what most people would consider. Um, now, in terms of uh, doing a bariatric surgery for kidney transplantation, this is a nice uh, review of... Um, of uh, patients between 1991 and 2004. You can see there from a timing standpoint, we're looking at pre-listing um, uh, patients, patients who are on the wait list, and uh, a group of patients who've already had a transplant and uh, were undergoing surgery afterwards. For this review, the gastric bypass was the uh, most common procedure, and as you can see, the mortality rate was uh, much higher than what, uh, as bariatric surgeons, what, <laughs> what we're used to. Um, but it's also important to point out that after um, uh, kidney transplant, bariatric surgery, uh, particularly with intraoperative hypotension and uh, dehydration, it, the patients actually do have a real risk of losing their transplanted kidney. Um, and in this uh, review, there was one uh, transplanted uh, recipient who lost their graft. Uh, in terms of, so that was gastric bypass mostly, so sleeve gastrectomy, this is a small, I know only 20 patients, um, uh, single center, uh, but they didn't have any complications or readmissions or mortality. Um, uh, with bariatric, uh, I'm sorry, with sleeve gastrectomy and, uh, and um, pre-transplant patients. 
and uh, which is good. And after kidney transplant, they had a much lower um, rate of delayed graft function and readmissions when you compared them to a matched cohort. So this is definitely uh, an improvement and a benefit to the patient. Uh, so uh, another uh, uh, poster that was presented here uh, by Dr. Montgomery was doing the same sort of thing, looking at the comparison of or the risk of sleeve gastrectomy versus gastric bypass in patients with end-stage renal disease. And as you would guess, uh, the uh, sleeve gastrectomy is a uh, lower uh, risk and lower complication rates. Um, okay, that is kidney transplant. Now liver transplant, um, and a common theme, obesity affects every organ system in the body. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so in interesting fact here, very high rates, and actually the rate of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease progressing to NASH is, is, is remarkably high, and now the second leading cause for uh, liver transplantation. Uh, and bariatric surgery and with weight loss uh, results in histologic recovery and improved uh, scores, which is good. Now, flip side of this, the risks. Uh, certainly absorption can be compromised, and that goes to say with any kind of bariatric procedure, but this is a particularly important when patients are taking uh, immunosuppressive medication. It seems to be higher after gastric bypass. And one important point from a, um, from a procedure uh, standpoint is about 17% of patients after a liver transplant need access to the biliary tree because they have some sort of complication. That uh, is definitely problematic after a gastric bypass. So. Um, Using IR and doing a transhepatic group is one option, but certainly doing a sleeve gastrectomy um, would uh, be uh, better. So uh, this uh, study looks at um, 11 studies, only 56 patients, uh, but it's, it's the best that, we, uh, that I've seen out there in terms of um, uh, outcomes for liver transplant patients. And it certainly improves graft function, reduces steatitosis, and uh, portal inflammation. And I'm gonna, it's gonna be hard to read all this, so I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly, but it looks mostly at the timing question, which is um, bariatric surgery before liver transplant, so that was 26 people during transplant, so concurrently, you know, take the liver out, do the sleeve, put a liver in. Um, that was done in eight cases, and then after liver transplant, 22 cases. And looking down at the bottom there, uh, mean age was 55 years old. Uh, age at liver transplant was um, 51 because there's a higher group of patients in the bariatric surgery after liver transplant. Mean BMI was uh, 47, um, and the BMI at liver transplant was 36. And that's important when I show you the next few slides when it comes to when do we do these operations. Um, looking at the patients who had bariatric surgery before liver transplant, you can see that their BMI went from um, 48 to 32, 32.9. So that's a pretty good drop in this patient population. Um, and the uh, mean length of time between bariatric surgery and the liver transplant was 1.4 years. And you have to take into consideration maximal weight loss, but also availability of the organs. Um, and then really quickly, too, in terms of approach, um, all the uh, patients who had uh, bariatric surgery before liver transplant had a lapsed sleeve. Um, during the transplant, well, it was done open because they're doing a transplant. And then afterwards, you actually see a smattering of both lap and open because, sure enough, it's going to be a difficult plane to get into uh, after a liver transplant to try to do um, a bariatric procedure. Uh, but there's a, a variety there of uh, bypass, sleeve, and yeah, even one duty and switch as a brave soul. Um, overall, complication rates, pretty high. I mean, as you would expect in the liver transplant uh, population. And... I think with all this, we see a general theme is that obesity uh, causes a problem, and that problem uh, is hard to fix because of the obesity, and then the obesity makes the problem even worse. So it's this vicious cycle, and this intervention of bariatric surgery is um, a really good way to um, break that cycle so that patients can have access to the original problem that they, um, they went to go see their doctor for. And this is a scenario where I think we have to have a little bit better uh, or clearer guidelines in terms of how to help these patients, particularly with uh, weight loss tar targets within our consulting services like uh, orthopedic surgery and transplant uh, surgery. So um, this is, I looked it up, the American Association for Hip and Knee Surgeons, uh, they say to lose weight. Awesome, that's about it. Uh -huh. So I decided to, uh, to tap into our collaboratives uh, in Michigan, which is uh, unique. We have a bariatric surgery collaborative. There's an orthopedic arthroplasty collaborative too. So we asked the surgeons, what's your cutoff for BMI? And it's actually all over the place and it's very surgeon specific. Um, one nice thing that we did find is that 88% of those uh, surgeons do refer to bariatric surgery and you can see the reasons why they wouldn't. But 
it's good, good data and good information to have, and I think it's good to establish uh, what those guidelines are going to be beforehand so the patients have the appropriate expectations. As for transplant candidates, as I mentioned before, about a fifth of, uh, of the patients have a BMI over 35, so this is a large um, population of patients. When I looked up um, what the cutoffs are for transplant surgery, it tends to be 35 to 40 is a relative contraindication, and over 40 is an absolute contraindication. Uh, however, in talking to the transplant surgeons, those numbers are all over the place as well. They say that it depends on where the body habitus lays and, and how they can access to the kidney. So uh, not very helpful either in terms of trying to tell a patient, well, how much weight do you need to lose so I can get my transplant? Um, one of the things that we do in our program is we try to predict the weight loss for our patients. And so we have this really neat um, outcomes uh, weight loss calculator that takes in, uh, into account 20 different patient um, variables as well as the procedure type. This taps into our data registry of over 80,000 patients and uses a statistical model to predict amount of weight loss. And I think this is important for the patients and again for the consulting services. So like just quick example and then I'll finish up. But 45-year-old um, female, BMI of 40, has renal disease, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. We can tell the orthopedic surgeon or the transplant surgeon, look, their BMI will come down to 27 after a gastric bypass. It'll come down to 30 after a sleeve gastrectomy. Complication rates, severe complication like leak and bleed is like close to 5% with the bypass and 2.5% with the sleeve in this, in this exact patient. Uh, and that's important. It's important for the patient and uh, in terms of having a complete uh, dialogue of uh, risks and benefits of surgery. And at the same time, different patients, different weight loss, different risks. 60-year-old African-American male, 6 foot 2, BMI 55. They have reflux and sleep apnea. They don't have renal failure, but they do have mobility problems, and they need orthopedic procedures. So it'll get them down to a BMI of 42 after bypass and down to a 44 after sleeve gastrectomy. Is that good enough for the orthopedic surgeon to do their knee operation? And if it's not, and it's really risky, well, that's a deeper conversation. So I think final thoughts, goals versus expectations. I think using these uh, calculators help with the... Uh, with the conversation. I think it has to do more with meeting a certain target to get the surgery versus the amount of time uh, interval. And I would advocate for a more personalized approach to these uh, types of procedures as opposed to a one size fit all for a protocol. And it's also an opportunity for us to advocate for our patients in terms of reducing barriers and improving our coordination of care. So thanks for your attention.